Hi, I'm James from Chaosium. A little while ago, I sat down with David Larkins, the line editor for Pendragon, and we talked about some of his favorite parts of the system. We never got to use that video during the series of interviews that we released during the lead up, but we're gonna release it now because it talks about some really interesting things and we hope you enjoy it. I'll jump across the interview in just a moment, but first, please remember to subscribe and thanks for watching. Pendragon is a game uh, where everyone plays a knight and what do knights do? They fight. They get into combat and so um there have been some small tweaks to the combat system here and there so fundamentally the same system of opposed roles and the winner does damage and all that stuff but one of these small tweaks that i really really like because it's it's just really added a lot of flavor and excitement to the six edition games i've been running is the mounted charge action one of the things greg wanted was to define uh, actions a little more uh, with a little more granularity uh, just so that it was a little more clear like some of the the cool things you can do in combat and uh, so overall I mean that that kind of opens things up um, you know and I've I've seen players uh, get really creative with their uh, approaches to combat at times when necessary but one thing knights do all the time is mounted charges on horseback with a lance right I mean that's the the archetypal image of a knight. And um, there's a great mechanic in the mounted charge rules. I guess I would just sum it up by saying uh, mounted charge fumble table, really, because, <laughs> uh, you know, it's fun. And <laughs> um, it's something that the players enjoy, even when it happens to them. So you got to give us a little bit of a teaser here. Do you, do you want to talk about that yeah. in a bit more detail, or can 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 I roll on a fumble table? Would that be uh, would that be too much? Oh, I I think that's a great idea. Absolutely. So so the way it works is, say you're you're uh, in a combat situation and you see someone you want to charge, and so you know you roll your you roll against your charge skill. So this is this is another. Uh, newer thing in sixth edition is is you have a charge skill that um, um, you use in place of any weapon skill. So you might you might be really handy with a sword or even a spear, but not so great when you're charging, right? So you can you um, can you can even have like a high lance skill that you use in combat or whatever, or if you're charging yeah. with a sword, right? Like your, but... yeah, like your spear skill, exactly, exactly. And then, uh, but yeah, if you're charging, maybe you're not so good at that or vice versa, of course, maybe you're really devastating on a charge. And then <laughs> once you get stuck in, you're not so good. Is there a capping mechanic like in uh, some of the other uh, versions where, you know, you, your your charge can't be better than your sword skills. So you can't be, you know, better with a sword if, if, if you're not charging or something like that. The capping mechanic is your horsemanship skill. And that applies to all weapon skills. So when you're on horseback, it caps your charge skill, also caps your sword, spear, whatever uh, skill. That's your base skill, I should add. Um, bonuses from passions or other things can take it above horsemanship. But um, but yeah, it's it's just based on the you know fundamental truth that you can uh, you can really know how to wield a sword on foot. But wielding a sword while you're sitting on the back of a live animal that's moving around is like a whole other skill set. And so you have to be a good horseman and, as well as uh, know how to swing your sword. Um, so let's say that you are charging and you have rolled a fumble, which uh, in Pendragon's you've rolled a 20, assuming that your skill is less than 20. So what you would then do is you would roll against your horsemanship. So again, horsemanship comes into play here. So um, let's say you've got a, a decent horsemanship of 15. So roll against your horsemanship of 15 on a d20. Okay, fantastic. Now here's the embarrassing bit where I need to go and grab my dice. Rolling. Okay. I rolled exactly a 15. Wow, okay, so that is a critical success. That is the oh my best God. <laughs> possible outcome you could have gotten. <laughs> so you really, you, you squeaked by on the mounted lance charge fumble table because a critical success just means that you've shattered your lance no further ill effects so you know you're gonna have to draw your sword or your, your side weapon next round but other than that you're okay okay um but if you had rolled say a regular success your lance would have shattered 
and he would have been struck by flying splinters and taken 1d6 damage, you know. Um, <laughs> that's obviously the most common outcome since most people have decent horsemanship uh, skills. Um, however, when we get into the failure and the fumbles, that's where it really gets fun. And of course, these don't happen all the time. Um, it's actually pretty rare because, again, most people have decent horsemanships and fumbles are, you know, 5% of the time at worst. Uh, but when they do happen, it always makes for a memorable moment. And basically what happens either way is that you have, uh, on the charge, allowed your lance to actually hit the ground. You, you've lost control of it sufficiently that it hits the ground and the tip buries itself in the, in the earth. And you get pole vaulted out of your saddle and over the front of your horse. Um, and it's really just a matter of how badly you fail determining how much damage you take. On a fumble, you go flying, your lance is broken, obviously, and you take 3d6 damage, um, which is um, has a good chance of uh, causing a major wound, actually. Um, but like I say, those don't happen very often. But when they do, everyone has a good laugh. That's phenomenal. I love it. Thanks so much, David. <laughs> so I'd love to hear just from a creative perspective, you know, a game dev perspective, what what mm -hmm. really inspired the way that you put this rule together? Uh, what what was a bit of the creation process like? Well, so this this was uh, Greg's you know work, uh, and you know my understanding is I wasn't you know sitting next to him when he wrote the rule, but my understanding is that this, like many other uh, of the rules in Sixth Edition Combat, came from um, reading and also discussions with uh, you know what you might call like. Um, combat archaeologists, right? People who participate in recreations of as close to actual medieval combat as we can, you know, determine from primary sources, uh, fighting manuals, etc. Um, you know, he really wanted to uh, just double down on evoking a sense of what it was like to fight as a knight and a medieval environment, you know, again, we've talked about what makes medieval fantasy medieval fantasy, you know, and it, and that's, that's a big part of it. You, you should come away kind of feeling like you, you have an idea of why armor is important, why it's important to be, to know how to sit in the saddle and, and guide your war horse using just your knees and um, pressure on the stirrups so that you have both hands free you know, the difference between riding into combat on a combat trained warhorse and riding into combat on a horse that hasn't been trained for combat and how much more difficult that is. So you can, if you can pull this sort of preview you've given us along into a little bit of a promo of how the combat and even some of the mechanics work in Pendragon more broadly, the charge mm -hmm. mechanic seems like it really, really, it's, it, it gives you a really, really exciting way to look at a pretty niche aspect of the nightly experience. Do you think that in Pendragon broadly, is, 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 is this sort of a consistent approach? Are we looking at skills that are, that, that govern each part of the life of a knight? Or are we is, is it something that is looking more at, you know, a generic set of skills that are applied to every situation? Oh, yeah. No, it, every, everything is um, keyed into... Uh, the knight's worldview, their POV. So like the skill list, for example, um, it's a shorter skill list than you might find in RuneQuest or Call of Cthulhu. And that's partly because the skills are the sorts of skills that knights care about. So they, you know, wouldn't necessarily have uh, skills in farming, for example. Uh, they would know how to administer an estate. That's important. So you have stewardship, which is a skill but they wouldn't know how to hook up a, a plow to an oxen or whatever, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, there's certain skills that, that they're just not even allowed to learn, like how to, um, how to care for someone who's been wounded, uh, gravely wounded, because that's the domain of priests and ladies, you know, that's not what a knight does. You, you can patch up a battlefield wound, but, you know, beyond that, you hand your friend off to the local monastery and move on, you know? So um, every skill in Pendragon is is geared towards evoking a knightly experience, whether you're on the battlefield or you're at courts or you're hunting, you know, or out out with the falcons, you know, it's all geared around that that experience. 
um, to the extent that, you know, <laughs> yeah, there are, there are no default uh, non-nightly skills, right? So, so even if someone wanted to uh, hook up a plow to an ox, uh, first of all, they'd lose honor because they're engaging in non-nightly behavior, but also they wouldn't even know how to do it. There's no skill they can roll against, you know? Um, and then in combat, uh, and this has been a feature of the game all along, and it's one of my favorite parts of the game uh, since I started playing, is that you have these different weapon skills, and that's because different weapons function differently against, uh, particularly against like different types of armor. So like you might have a a mace and a mace is really good against male armor, right? The, you know, or chain mail, uh, as we might call it, um, you know, because of that impact, right? You know, you, you, you hit someone hard enough with a big blunt object and, and the shock waves are going to go through the links on the chain mail and uh, cause, you know, blunt force trauma. But maces aren't great against plate armor because they're just going to bounce right off. What you need against plate armor is a nice, good old-fashioned pick that's just going to punch right through the uh, the metal on the plate armor, you know. And so as the campaign moves along and armor gets better, you have to sort of train in, like, these new weapon systems or your, your, uh, your next character, your heir, might have to do that, you know, if you're doing generational uh, campaigning. And so over time what is effective on the battlefield changes, which, you know, is also a reflection of, of actual medieval history. I love that. And that's a super exciting concept that I don't think I've personally seen maybe outside of sci-fi games where you're unlocking new types of technology. So that's a right, really right. concept. Yeah. Does this idea of having a specific focus, you know, really putting the knight's POV first, as you sort of said, apply to the way that combat is designed to run are you not expected to maybe get into some of the gruffer grittier styles of fighting and are you expected to be more battling other knights or you know maybe battling a, a group of bandits rather than finding yourself suddenly in a unexpected tavern brawl where a bunch of knives are pulled out Unless maybe you're being spectacularly assassinated. <laughs> spectacularly assassinated. That's that's a condition that can apply in the game. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, that's the thing. And, and this is where the glory mechanic actually comes in in a lot of ways, because, you know, that's the point of the game. What, does the, what is Pendragon's core activity? You are acquiring glory for your knight. That's what you do. Combat is one of the best ways you can do that. However... Not all opponents are created equal when it comes to glory, because obviously it's glory. If you get into a tavern brawl and you, you know, beat up some local toughs, um, you know, some people might talk about it for a day or two, but you're a knight. That's what you're supposed to do. You know, it, it would be more notable if you got beaten up. I, I don't know. As a GM, I might actually award more glory if that happened, because <laughs> um, glory is kind of value neutral. You know, it's it's just something notable that happens to you that people talk about, right? Um, but no, I mean, you you want to fight other knights if possible, or dangerous monsters. Um, those are some great sources of glory. Uh, also, you know, very deadly. So it's this, it's this really interesting dance, really, between, like, potential glory, um, you know, danger level, which you then would have to maybe roll against your valorous trait to even get into that fight. Uh, and then, you know, in terms of if you're on the losing end, you have certain mitigating mechanics like major wounds or unconsciousness that are going to save you, you know, possibly from being just outright killed unless you're really unlucky, you know. So um, it's set up in a way that you're going to be getting into combat a lot, but you should also be sort of thoughtful about it, you know? And yeah, like, um, you know, like defeating bandits in and of itself would not bring you a lot of glory because these are, you know, bandits are usually just commoners with, you know, some spears and cheap, you know, bows and whatever. But, um, you know, if the bandits had been causing a lot of problems along this stretch of the King's Road and you were doing this at Arthur's request, then completing that little adventure would get you some extra glory right there because you you did something for the king and he you know probably you know uh acknowledges that at his next uh court you know so to close things off with the mechanics of pendragon working in a in a more 
conscious, I suppose, a more deliberate way, how is this going to change your stories and what advice would you give to GMs or even players who are going to be jumping into Pendragon? Um, you know, I have found that the way it's changed my Pendragon games is that combat tends to be a bit more dynamic. Uh, it tends to have more of a sense of movement, even when I'm using Theater of the Mind, which is kind of my my usual approach. I don't really use miniatures or battle, battle mats or maps or anything like that. And yet there's still this like real sense of movement. Um, you're going to find your combats are going to be more memorable, whether it's from uh you know <clears throat> sir uh <laughs> sir asterius uh accidentally pole vaulting himself over the you know front of his horse or whether it's you know um this pict has grabbed the treasure that you were supposed to be guarding and he's running for it and you you do this like desperate flying tackle and you take him down at the last minute just before he makes his escape you know i mean these are these are examples i'm coming up with you know off the top of my head from my own games you know like and, and there are things I remember, right? Because it's just, it's exciting. And in the past, you know, uh, Pendragon combat's always been pretty fast and straightforward, but, you know, it tended to just kind of become like a contest of opposed uh, roles until somebody went down, you know? And like now that's still, you know, that's still a possibility. You can still score that lucky critical hit and take someone out unexpectedly, but there's also these other ways that you can try and end a combat. 